22. You can turn now if you want to, but it's going to take us a while to get there. So this week where we're going to start is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. So give you a second if you want to turn there. I hope if you, if you heard through, and hopefully God was doing something, as we were beginning today and starting in the book of Exodus, and starting with God calling Moses to do some very big things, and Moses even in that moment realizing, that's okay, again, a lot of people leave church that way. Uh, it's... Uh, my first Sunday in church, that's what it was too, but that, that boy will be a preacher someday. Uh, um, so my good friend Tiger Woods was, I have lost now. Uh, where are we? Start over. No. So if you track where we were at the beginning, I, I hope you hear through that. I hope, I hope God, well, I, I know God's, we'll talk about that in a second. God is speaking. I, the question is, are we listening? In Exodus, here's God calling Moses to this great work. And I love that Moses realizes that within myself, I could do some pretty cool stuff. I know because I've done a lot. He, he, he had done a lot of cool things as a, as a leader. But he realized in that moment, I, don't send me unless you're going with us, unless your presence is with us. Because what else would make me distinct from the people around me other than you? Show me your glory. Don't send me without the presence of your Holy Spirit. That was his prayer, really. And here's the Apostle Paul now, thousands of years later, praying something very similar for us to get it. <clears throat> so last week we ended with the realization that we have this amazing, empowering gift of God's presence actually living inside of us. And Paul knew this. He taught it and he prayed it. And he prayed with passion that we would get this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that we would get this. I pray today that your presence, your Holy Spirit would speak into each and every one of our lives right where we are at and move us from those places wherever it is that you're calling us to. Help us, Father, to trust you in these moments and to lean in and to listen to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> in the middle of his letter, well, towards the beginning of his letter to the church to Ephesus, Paul writes this. And I want to pick up a couple of verses before his prayer. The prayer starts in 15, but we're going to start in verse 13. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. This is his, what I would call his Holy Spirit prayer. This, God, open the eyes of my heart. And he begins with, which is important for us, in verse 13 of chapter 1. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? Paul is telling the church that once you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. And so... I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me who, by, oh, by the way, verse 14, is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It's almost like this already not yet kind of transaction. You've received the Holy Spirit upon faith. And so now Paul, here's Paul's prayer. For this reason, knowing all of this, knowing the blessings of God, knowing the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation of the, in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. He's praying that the eyes of our hearts would be open, that we would know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, which is according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that was at work in raising Christ from the dead, the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, 
is actually indwelling inside of us, Ephesians 1.13. And Paul is praying that the eyes of our hearts would be open, that we would understand the immeasurable greatness of his power that lives inside of us. That same power that he used, that, he, that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, verse 20. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and, ab- <clears throat> and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. Paul is saying, I have not stopped praying for you that the moment I've heard about your faith, that you would get, that your eyes of your hearts would be opened, that you would understand this immeasurable great power that lives inside of you, which is the same power that was at work in raising Christ from the dead, lives inside of you. And Paul is saying, I am praying that you get this. Obviously, Moses got it years before who said, I will not go unless your presence, your power goes with me. Paul's Holy Spirit prayer is, do you realize that God's presence, God's Holy Spirit lives inside of us? And it is powerful. So, I jotted a few things down I want to read. If this is true, if we have this amazing power within us, the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God dwelling inside of us, then I just got to ask, why are Christians who are empowered, spirit-filled beings constantly so hung up on stupid stuff? I know that's a real technical word to use there, but why? Why? If this is true, Paul's praying. I could just visualize him begging and pleading on his knees all those years ago. God, help these people to get it. And all these years later, we get so hung up on stupid stuff. Why do Christians fight and argue, conquer, divide, and quit over so many trivial kinds of things that are just stupid? And you expect people like me to entertain the stupidity and get all caught up in dumb details. Why why is this awesome power? And I I hinted at this last week. This is my problem is that when we talk Holy Spirit, it's either like an all-in crazy thing or it's a, a, some afraid of it and just ignore it and dismiss it totally. It's like one of two. Why is this awesome power so often seen And only one of these two kinds of opposite expressions of the Spirit. From an absolute one, out of control zoo with jumping, yelling, screaming, modes of hysteria, like something out of a Richard Simmons sweating to the oldies on crack. (laughs) I thought that was funny. I I wrote that too. That's very funny. We're we're addicted in this level, I'm afraid, to the next high of being Spirit-filled. I hear people all, oh, I was so filled with the Spirit. But then you're such an absolute jerk during the week. I, I, years and years ago, I worked at a, at a place, uh, and, and, and I worked with someone who went to a church that thing, I went to the church once, and it was, it, it was, it was, it was more than I could handle. It was, it was crazy. There was a lot of stuff going on. And he would tell me every week, oh, it was so awesome what happened in church. But yet you should have heard the way he talked at work. If God was so awesome in that moment, why is he not moving in the rest of your week? We get addicted to the next high of being spirit-filled or there's just an absolute boredom in worship, which we excuse so often in styles more what I'm used to in terms of reverence in worship. We need to be reverent, which means I just wanted to take a nap, some bored. We, We know more about LeBron The Donald, Hillary, Isis, or Prince, than we do about the Spirit of God. I'm not going to go down a rabbit trail, but I'm just going to say it. If I went on any of our Facebook, our Facebook pages this week, I would learn all I need to know about what's cool going on with LeBron, the Donald, Hillary, Isis, Prince. Some of you throw Bible verses out, it's great. But what do we know about the Spirit of God? We're so afraid of all these other things. 
We're so worked up about it. But do we know, remember, we have the amazing power, gift, presence of God's spirit living inside of me. And I'm worried about the Donald, Hillary, ISIS, or something about Prince, or if LeBron's going to finally bring a championship home to Cleveland. And, and, and we're totally dismissive of the power of the Holy Spirit. In a church context that's maybe more of what many of us are used to, we deny it, we suppress it, or we just plain flat ignore it, the movement of God's Spirit in our lives and in our midst. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, where you have felt that just, I should, I should say this, I should go somewhere, I should, I should do something, and you suppress it, and you suppress it and ignore it. And I don't want to do anything with that. And I'm afraid of that. Or somebody comes to you and says, I, I, I feel like God wants to say something. And no, I ignore it. I ignore it. Because it doesn't fit in my context for what I think about Holy Spirit. And, and neither of these, I don't think, in my opinion, and I don't mean to be offensive if you come out of either of these traditions. I, 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 desi- I desire to be offensive, but I don't mean to be. Uh, I, but neither of these are rooted in biblical expressions. Neither one of them. Neither one of them. Not, neither one of them are, are concerned, I think, t- with truly being biblical. Not, neither one of them are really that worried about the, the power and the movement of the Holy Spirit. Because the sad thing is both of these can carry on very well without the Spirit. Very well. You, you can fake it. You can totally dismiss it. You can just play church. You can be completely, do all of these things without the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. You don't need it. You can go through the motions, you can, you can learn the tricks, you can learn all the little gimmicks, you can jump up and down, you can be reverent, and the Spirit isn't needed in that place at all. And you can go home and not be changed one single bit in both of those kinds of environments. Francis Chan, in his book, Forgotten God, he made the alarming statement, I thought alarming statement, that so much of what we do in church today can be done and is done totally without the Holy Spirit. That's why he talks, writes this book called Forgotten God, which is about the Holy Spirit. So, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? What should our lives and our churches look like if we are to be empowered, spirit-filled beings? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? And that's where we'll turn to some, a bunch of passages here. A biblical picture of the life in the Holy Spirit is just a handful of passages I want to put together for us. Last week, we began this kind of discussion in Acts 1-8, where we learned that we are empowered to be witnesses of Christ's resurrection. So we just have this general sense so far that we have the Holy Spirit to be empowered by God to be witnesses of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Next, let's go and and we'll see what Paul has to say. He has a number of things to say on the subject of the Holy Spirit. And all of these are in the back of the bulletin if you had one or want to follow along with these. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 is where we'll start. Just piecing together a few things about what Paul says the Holy Spirit and our relationship looks like. Number one, daily walking in the Spirit. We are called as Spirit-empowered, filled people to be daily walking in the Spirit. Now, in both of these extremes, this is where I fear we start to lose interest. Because if you truly get what a very long journey in daily walking is, it's easy to start zoning out. That's kind of boring. And it is boring. It's a daily walk in the spirit. Here's what Paul says. This is a little lengthier passage, but I I want us to hear it. Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, but I tell you, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Again, the picture is just me and God walking, me and the Holy Spirit walking together. And if I'm walking with the Holy Spirit, I won't be looking around and wanting to gratify the desires of the flesh. He says the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. It's, it's obvious, he says, what are the works of the flesh? Look in the mirror when you go home. Again, this is not one of these moments like, hey, are you listening to this? Because he's talking about you right now. This is, look in the mirror. He says it's obvious if you're being led by the flesh. It would look like this. Sexual immorality, impurities, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, 
orgies and things like these. Now, to be fair, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have things on this list that they're like, yep, yep, struggle, yep, ah, that's me, he's talking about me, please don't look at, I make eye contact with me right now because he must have known something. It's not that. Every one of us do. Go back to Romans 7 and Paul says, the good things I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things I know I should not do, I do do those things. So Paul tells us, hey, here's a list. It's obvious this is what's being led by the flesh or what it looks like to be led by the flesh. And he says, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things, those that these define your life, this is the kind of person that you are. You will not inherit the kingdom of God because these things are contrary to the things of God's spirit. But the fruit of the spirit in verse 22, he says, is... So what does the Holy Spirit look like? What is the fruit of the Spirit? How do I know if somebody's truly being filled and led by the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. I don't need to tell you a certain law because you'll just treat others in the right kind of way, he says. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and his desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited and provoke one another and envying one another. So Paul's first thing is if you want to be what is a biblical picture of what it looks like to have this all-empowering gift of the Holy Spirit inside you, it's a daily walk with the Spirit. It's being led by the Spirit. It's hearing and trusting and obeying. It's, it's behaving. There's a uh, just as a quick one here, I don't, I don't know if this made the notes or not. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Just let me read it real quickly. On, it's important to hear this one. Paul, here's, here's clear again back in the Old Testament, talking about the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of God. It says in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, I will give you a new heart and I will, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What does it look like to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit? It's being obedient to the word of God and the rules and laws of God. It's hearing, trusting, obeying, and behaving accordingly. It's listening to what God is saying. If you remember the Unstuck book that I talked about two or three weeks ago, within that book, there's this really neat place where, where he says that a guy came to his pastor and said, Pastor, would you pray that God speaks to me? And he said, the pastor looked at him and said, no, I will not. Because I believe God is a good father and God is speaking to you all the time. I'm going to pray that you will listen. Any parents with kids that could relate? I talk to my kids all the time. They hear maybe 2% of what I say. Maybe. I talk to, let's just say, people all the time. I'm not naming it. I'm just, I, I, I question all the time if they catch like maybe 10% of what I said that day. He says, now I won't pray that God will speak to you. God is speaking to you. I believe that. I'm going to pray that you will listen. See, walking is not just talking. Walking is also listening. What do you want to say to me? I can't think of any better way to listen to God is also just spending time in this book and listening. God, what do you want to say to me today? So the first thing he says is daily walking in the Spirit. The second thing that Paul teaches us, and these are from a few places of letters of Paul, the second thing he says is do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He says, do not let any corrupting talk, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building people up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So it's interesting he begins with, watch the words you use to other people. Don't be discouraging to other people. Don't be negative to them. Don't be de demeaning to anyone. And then verse 30, he says, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make the Holy Spirit sad. How do I make the Holy Spirit sad? 
but, but the things I say, how I hurt other people, I'm damaging other kinds of relationships. It saddens my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Think about this personally, even in our own lives. Go back to the point we just made. When you speak to your kids, you tell your kids to do something, they don't do it. It's disappointing. It makes me sad. It's God's children not listening. Our words hurt others. They hurt our relationship with God. Is it not true that if you have a friend and I speak ill of their friend, it hurt, can hurt my relationship with this friend? In, our, in, our, in, in uh, the uh, TLC class, we're reading a, a book called uh, Sacred, Sacred Marriage, and I can't remember if it's Sacred Marriage or his other book, but he mentions it in there that to husbands and to wives. Do, do you realize, so say husbands, husbands, do you realize that you're, you're married? to God's daughter. God's your father-in-law. So he's, he used this example that I thought was really great. So I would say for me, so someday one of my girls gets married to some idiot and they love me. And they're like, you know, Reverend Hindle, you're, you're the man. I love you. You're so great. I want to, where are you going? You're going golf and I'm going with you. you you're going to, you shovel in your driveway. I'm coming with you. You need help? I'm, I love you. You know, I love you so much. I'm going to give you 10% of what I make at work. Here you go. And then I find out that when you go home, you're hurting my daughter. You're disrespecting my daughter. I find out that your words are demeaning to my daughter that you don't get your lazy butt up and do nothing to help my daughter. How is my relationship with you going to be? I'm going to have some problems with you that we need to get fixed. Am I not? It's a great way of thinking about, I'm sitting here praying as a man, then God, bless my life, bless me, help me. God, I want to live for you. And he's saying, you want to start living for me? Look at your own home and how you speak to the people that you live with. You are disrespecting my daughter and she lives in your home and you think you want to change the world. I'm not about to give you nothing. Wives, it's the same thing. Us, it's the same thing. I'm, God, bless me, bless me. And yet I'm disrespecting somebody I work with. I've got anger and bitterness towards people in my heart. Believe it or not, God loves those people too. They may be far for God, even more so God would love them and say, I want them home. And I put you in that workplace. And the only example of Christ that they have is you, and you're ruining everything. And you want me to bless you. Why? So you could drive around in a Porsche and flaunt it in front of that person you don't like? Not going to do it. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, dis, it's, it's, it's disruptive to our relationship with God when our relationships here are disruptive. Why else would Jesus say, if you're going to the church and you're offering your gift to the altar and you remember that somebody has something against you, stop what you're doing, leave it there, and go fix that thing. God cares about this stuff. You are not, we are not now walking in the Spirit if I'm in bad relationships. I get it that stuff happens. I get it that we can't fix everything. I get it. I get it. But it's important to try to figure this stuff out because I fear that I'm grieving the Holy Spirit if I'm treating others around me poorly and I'm disrespectful to them and yet I want God to respect me. Daily walk in the Spirit, Paul says. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Rather, Paul would say, if you... We go to the next chapter in Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk with the Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. He says this. Do not get drunk with wine. It's an opposite picture between being, being out of control physically and being in control with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine for that's debauchery. It leads to debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit and address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's done, I believe, by walking more and more with God, with God's Spirit, with Jesus every single day and not grieving that relationship. My relationship tank gets filled up, if you will, the more that I spend time together. Is that not true of earthly relationships? 
when I'm so disconnected with my spouse or with close relatives, friends, family, I, the relationship is grieved. It's, 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 it's disconnected. But the more we spend time together, the more we communicate, the more we're on the same page, the relationship, in a sense, is filled up. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not some magical, majestic thing that I pray for. It is actually rooted in a deep daily walk with the Spirit of God, and I am filled up to then serve others. I go out and I serve. I go out and I live. I go out and I love, and I lose that tank, and I need it filled back up. And so I come back to his word. I come back to church. I come back to prayer, and I get filled up, and I serve, and I love, and I go. Follow Jesus in the Gospels. It's the same thing. He's doing ministry, ministry, healing, helping people, doing this, and then he's off by himself alone. Very early in the morning, he got up, went out by himself. Then he went out, and he ministered, and he helped, and he loved, and he cared for people, and got up early, and he went off by himself. Jesus was over by himself, praying and with the disciples, and then he ministered, and he helped, and he did stuff. I know some of you this is totally sacrilegious to even think about, and you wouldn't even imagine that I would say something as crazy as the idea of, I believe that Jesus had those 12 also because they were fun to be around for him. I mean, when you read in the Gospels and it says Jesus did some ministry over here in this city and then they went over to that town, they didn't have a car. They're walking. I mean, what did it take now, like three days to get to the next town? What were they doing in those three days? I can't help but feel, God forbid me for saying this, Lord, if I'm wrong, I don't know. Let me live at least another day and I'll correct it. I bet they laughed on that journey. I bet they filled one another up. They had replenishing relationships. They were like, man, did you see when we were in that place what that guy over there in the corner was doing? They actually smiled and had fun and laughed. You need that kind of stuff in your life. Godly people that are just filling you up and encouraging you and building you up so we can go out and do it again. Paul says, I want you to daily walk in the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is done by walking more and more every day and not grieving. It's not a question of who has more of the Spirit. Churches do this, and it's irritating. It's so stupid. One church will say, well, we're just more filled with the Spirit than you are. Are you kidding me? You're ridiculous. Every one of us has filled up with the Holy Spirit. The question is, how much of the Holy Spirit got you? And so you may look like you got the Holy Spirit on Sunday because you're dancing like John Travolta, Molly Ringwald, or what was it, doing the Carlton. You're doing all these things. You think you got the Holy Spirit. The question is, how much does the Holy Spirit got a hold of you? Because that guy I knew many, many years ago who said, man, I'm just so filled up with the Holy Spirit on Sunday morning. But then when you're at work and I'm looking like, did you just steal that? Did you, the Holy Spirit obviously don't have a, a bit of your life. The question is not how much spirit I got. The question is, how much does the Holy Spirit got me? In verses 19 to 20 of this chapter 5, just flow out of what the Holy Spirit would look like. He says, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And what does it look like? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks for everything and for everything to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit life will begin to look like inside of you. And it'll be projected outside when people will see. So Paul says, I want you to daily walk with the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And don't quench the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't don't put out the Spirit's fire. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. It's rooted in a context of what he's saying here, so we'll need to grab that here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain for every form of evil. Build the relationship. Be filled up. It's rooted in do not despise prophecies. Don't quench the spirit. God was doing something in the midst of that church, bringing people in to speak, obviously, some kind of word of God to that church, and they were despising those prophecies of other people. So he said, don't quench what the Spirit is trying to do in that place. God was bringing a word for that people in that place, and you didn't want to hear it. Maybe it didn't fit in your framework with what the Holy Spirit does. In the context, don't despise spiritual gifts and namely hear prophecy, but listen to it, test it, examine it, And follow it if it lines up. 
you know my, my theory, my theology, that a lot of bad theology is done over a bunch of bad tacos on a Saturday night. Dr. Watson gave me that many, many years ago. I got to give him credit. But he said a lot of people write a lot of bad theology, and it's just because they had a bunch of bad tacos on a Saturday night, and they thought God was moving, but it was really just indigestion. So I want to, if you tell me, hey, God gave me a word, and it's for you. First question I'm going to have is, what did you eat for dinner last night? I'll just start there. Second question is, okay, where did you get this from? What is this? And then the third, I'm going to go, give me some time. Let me pray, and I'm going to go back to the word on this. Because I'm not taking your word for it. Not a person in this room should sit here and say, well, Pastor Scott said it. That's the word of God. Let's go home. You're foolish if you do that. I didn't have tacos last night, though, but you're foolish. Take this stuff. Take the notes. Go home and read it and study it for yourself. And if test it, examine it. If it lines up, if it fits, then do it. Don't quench the Holy Spirit, what God may be doing, just because it doesn't fit in your framework or with your, what you're comfortable with, but do it. And the last thing that Paul would encourage us and say here, and I'll just read it or, or quote it from memory, 2 Corinthians Timothy 1, 6. He says, I want you to fan into flame the gift of the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. So Paul tells us, you want to know what a biblical picture of the life lived in the Holy Spirit is? It is, number one, you are empowered with this amazing gift inside of you to be witnesses of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. You are to daily, we are to daily walk in the Spirit, trusting and hearing and listening and obeying. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit and to be considerate of the relationships around us and how that might be damaging even my relationship with God. You are to be filled with the Holy Spirit by constantly walking more and more each day and not grieving the Spirit. I'm not quenching the Holy Spirit. I'm not putting out the Spirit's fire because God might move in some weird and wacky way this week, but if I'm putting it out and saying, nope, nope, I'm not listening to that. That's not it. God wouldn't do that. I might actually be quenching the Holy Spirit, but I want to fan it into flame, which essentially involves me taking one step it takes a risk. It's a step of faith. This, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not sure about this. But I feel like God is leading me, and I'm, I'm willing to take a risk. As adults, we, we tend to stop taking risks and putting ourselves out there in any kind of way because I don't want to get hurt, and I don't want to do anything weird. I don't, we're, it's, you think it's over in junior high, but it's not. I don't want to do anything that's going to be around somebody that I don't like. In fact, I think it gets worse. We start to wall ourselves in and I'll never go anywhere with anyone who's any different than me and might like challenge me in some way and make me feel uncomfortable. Like, what am I, 10 years old? I mean, but we act this way as adults. But God might actually have a blessing on the other side of that hurdle he's asking you to cross. And in that, Paul is saying to, to Timothy in that context, you're fanning into flame this gift. Fan it into flame. Let God move in your life. Let some amazing stuff happen. And amazing stuff happen around us and in our world. He might actually choose for some weird reason you or me to do it. All right, I went a little longer than the 25, I think, but I lost track. Um, so here's the last five. The, the problem is not the connection. Or, I'm sorry, the problem is the connection, not the power. The problem in this is the connection, not the power. Power source is good. The problem is we are so disconnected. There is too much of me and not enough of him. I mean, that could be it, but we, I said we're gonna, we got to end in Leviticus 23 because it's back to the day of Pentecost. So it's Leviticus 23, 22 in one second. The problem is not the connection. The problem is that I am so disconnected in so many of my relationships. And the key to success here, I believe, seeing growth in our lives comes down to one question, which takes us back to the day of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks in Leviticus chapter 23. It's this one little, well, all of Leviticus is probably obscure but one little even obscure verse in the midst of all of these feasts and descriptions of sacrifice this bull, do this, get this, make this offering, do this blood offering, all these things, right in the midst of it, at the end of the Feast of Weeks, the day of Pentecost, which is what we talked about last week, it says this. Remember, these feasts are all tied into agriculture and your harvest, and you offer the first part of your grain, and you give these as gifts and offerings to God. And he says this at the end of this. When you reap the harvest of your land, 
You shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So what? So God's saying, you just had this great spring harvest. You've got all this stuff now. You gave me a little bit as a part of the offering, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave the edges of your field for the poor and those that are traveling. I want you to leave room for them. Uh, The stuff that falls along the ground, I want you to go back and pick it up with a fine-tooth comb and every little piece is mine and this is all mine and be greedy. I want you to leave those for others. I want you, in a sense, to leave room for God to work in the lives of these people. That's the principle that he gave them at the end of the Feast of Weeks. The key to success of growth in the Spirit, living by the Spirit, seeing growth in our lives, comes down to one question rooted in that verse, to me at least. And the question is, do I have room for God in my life? Be honest. Be absolutely honest. Right now, I just don't. I mean, if you came to me right now and said, Scott, I want you to add this new hobby or whatever to your life, I got to be honest with you and say, I don't have the time right now. I got a lot going on. My kids are involved in activities. I don't have the time. It's going to be honest with you. I can't do it. Be honest. The question is, do you have room? Do we have room for God in our lives? Many of us, I think, have to answer honestly. Not right now, I don't. I want you to bless me. I'll I'll take whatever you want to pour out abundantly upon me, O righteous Lord. But I'm not going to do anything to live for you. When I retire, that's when I'm, I'll have time then. That's when I do that. But I make all these plans about living on the golf course, so I don't know how I'm going to fit you in then. Question is, do I have room for God? We are so disconnected from God and the relationship I think God wants us to have. And that's the problem. The power is not the problem. The power source is awesome and it's amazing and it's wonderful. The problem is I'm so disconnected. And I fear that we simply have no room left in our lives for God. He ends the Feast of Weeks with, I am the Lord your God. This is what it's all about. It's about you and it's about me and it's about what I want to do with you and through you and in spite of you. But you've got to get connected with me. Paul gave us a great template for how to do that. I just would end with this. What if, what if we trusted God in this? What if? What if we said, you know what? The world is pulling me in all sorts of different directions. The world is demanding my time, but maybe I need to say to the world, you know what? I don't have time for that right now because I've got bigger and better things to do. I'll never forget coming back to uh, one of the mission trips. I made the comment saying, man, wherever we were at, those people, they went to church every night. And the answer I got back was, that's because they have nothing better to do. That's what a Christian in this church told me. That was many, many years ago. So maybe it was one of you. Forgive me if you're holding on to that. But that's horrible that that's what we would say. And my response was, well, God bless us for having so many wonderful things to do that we don't have to go to church anymore. Praise God for that. Praise God. We don't have room anymore. What if I trusted God and said, you know what? I'm going to say no to this because I'm going to say yes to God. I'm going to say yes to what he wants me to do. This is not a speech about how we shouldn't be in sports and all these different things. It's a crime the way sports are taking over Sundays and Wednesdays. I'm, I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't say that. It's a crime that we're allowing it. It's a crime that we can't think of creative ways to redeem that. It's an absolute shame that we can't do it. It's our fault if we're letting it happen. All of that is true. But redeem it. Value it. You know what? The, sport, the professional sports teams play on Sundays. They got paid chaplains, and some of them are volunteers that go and offer chapel and and stuff. Why don't one of the parents say, you know what? If we're going to be here at 8 in the morning on a Sunday, I'm bringing my Bible and we're having chapel. I know that sounds like stupid. That's ridiculous. Like, who would actually do that? That's pretty dumb. God forbid, like, bring communion. You could still have church. There are creative ways, if we just thought about it, if I was filled up with the Holy Spirit and said, man, I'm missing my church, but I tell you what. I believe in the priesthood of all believers, so here I go. I'll put a little white collar on, serving communion to the people at the field. Let's go for it. 
Well, somebody will be offended. That's awesome. That's what I do every Sunday. You're, you're halfway there. What if we trusted God in this? What if we left room for him? What if we created space in our lives to say, I want God to move in my life, and I'm not going to ask you to bless what I've already scheduled out in my life. I'm going to sit back and create space and room for you to move and you to lead in my life. What if we actually did that? What if we made time to be with him and stop making excuses about I don't have time? What if we made that time? What if we were intentional about it? What if we made time to be available for other people so that God would move through us? What if we made time in the course of our week to live for God? And guess what? You don't got to change really anything. Sometimes it's just put on a new set of lenses. Wow, maybe God put me in this job, this hobby, this thing, so that I would be a missionary here and now. And I don't have to go and change careers and do anything different. What if we intentionally every single day created space for God to move in our lives? What if? What if? I, I, I just wonder what would happen in our lives, in the life of this church, and in this community, if we fully gave ourselves to him in that way. I wonder. I wonder. Let's pray. God. Open the eyes of our hearts so that we might see and know and live in the power of the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. Thank you for all of your gifts to us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.